guest today is the wonderful Wycliffe Gordon, renowned musician, composer, conductor, arranger, educator, the list goes on. I just uh, want to thank you for coming today and um, being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, before we get started, I guess I wanted to um, just list a couple of things. Man, your, your resume is just amazing to me. I even, um, haven't known you for a little while, I even went and tried to do some research and realized, man, this is so much stuff that I even didn't know. But um, I was just going to say that uh, apart from, you know, leading your, your own group, I know you do various sizes, you have um, a tremendous body of work that you compose, a lot of um, commissionings as well, that you um, currently faculty member of the Jazz Arts Program at Manhattan School of Music. Yes. Okay, and um, held positions in the past at Juilliard yes, and uh, Michigan State University. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. okay. The other thing I just want to say, because it's cool to me, is that um, you uh, were awarded honorary doctorate in 2006 from University of Scranton. Yes. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. So I should really be saying Dr. White. <laughs> well, if you want to. It's not necessary. <laughs> with or without the PhD, I'm still white. <laughs> Well, that's cool. That's cool. And I guess a lot of people know, but if not, you know, you're a former veteran member of the Wynton Marcellus Septet, as well as member of the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra yes. as well. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful, man. That's wonderful. Well, I guess one thing that stuck out to me as I was reading um, through, your, through, through your bio, mm -hmm. and um, I was curious about um, trombone and your choice um, on that instrument. I was reading that it said that your brother was playing it in junior high school, and then after that you decided to play. But I was curious if you had played something even before that, or if that was, you know, your first instrument. Well, well, piano was my first instrument, okay. actually. Okay. My father tried to get uh, me and my other siblings to take piano at an early age. Okay. But being a young boy growing up in the country, that was difficult when you're sitting at the piano going, ding, dong. And outside the window, you hear the other boys like, hey, throw the ball. So, right. You know, you didn't really want to sit at the uh, piano. So he, right. he, didn't, he didn't force us to uh, do it. But I did learn um, chopsticks in the boogie woogie. And then okay. that was stage you know, five or six. Okay. Then I took piano again at age 11, where okay. I studied with my um, sister, okay. um, Karen. I mean, okay. she and I took piano lessons together. My okay. piano teacher's name was Mr. Foster. But then I joined the um, band. My brother went to junior high school. He's a year older than I. Okay. And in our household, if uh, my mom, you know, parents got something, that meant they had to get two. The boys were going to fight over it. That could be, you know, dump truck, bubble gum, right. know, ice cream, anything. So right, right. He'd come home with a uh, trombone one day. He had to take a PE course and then another elective, and he chose band. And the band director kind of chose the trombone for it. But okay. all I knew was when he got home and he opened the case, it was a shiny something, shiny, yeah. new in the right. house. Right. Like, uh, I want one. Right, right. You know. So I, mean, I, I begged and pleaded with my mom until she eventually got, got a trombone for me. And then okay. the next year we were in junior high school together in the band. And um, after I joined the band, I, I took piano lessons for one more year. I continued to play piano for my uh, youth choir in my church, but... Um, I didn't want to take study piano anymore. I wanted to be in band, you know, because I was, you know, around lots of kids, um, you know, other uh, colleagues yeah. and band members. Yeah. Band class was always a room full of, you know, different instruments, right. and it wasn't just like one on one. So there was something about that I re that I really liked. Okay. But my brother Lucius um, coming home with the trombone one day was the thing that kind of sparked, you know, playing. I wanted to play trombone. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I really wanted to play drums. Okay. But my mom said, under no circumstances are we putting drums <laughs> in this house. You're right. making enough noise as it is. So yeah, yeah. Know. So trombone it was. Okay, okay. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Well, my next, it goes into my next question, which also leads into um, even your new CD, Wycliffe Gordon, Hello Pops, a tribute to Louis Armstrong. So my next question is, because you're playing trumpet on this as well, mm -hmm. yes. is that um, how many instru instruments do you play total? 23. 23? Yes. Okay, man. I was expecting you to say five or six. So 23. Well, I, I knew about piano. Done. I knew about um, trumpet, trombone, sousaphone. And two of them. All the brass instruments. Okay, all the brass French instruments. Drum. Okay. I play clarinet um, and um, bassoon. Even okay. I don't really wow. uh, claim. I can still, I still have my claim. I never yeah. even got a bassoon. But okay. I play um, instruments from different countries like the didgeridoo. Didgeridoo wow. from Australia. And, okay. Uh, uh, show. 
Okay. Um, so anyway, but um, I mostly just travel with the trombone. And while I'm doing this Hello Pop show, it's the yeah. trumpet. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful, man. You just blew my mind <laughs> with that. Now, how did you learn some of the instruments? Did you study abroad or just, you know, picking oh, them up? Or no, what? just uh, picking them up. Okay. I leave, you leave an instrument laying around in the band room. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, fooling around with you. He liked the upright bass. Okay. Um, when I was in college, well, when I was in high school, buddies of mine, we grew up in the same neighborhood, so we were in the band together. Yeah. And uh, we'd ride bikes together. Uh, different parents would take turns taking one another to band practice. Yeah. Or picking up from band practice or to football games or whatnot. And then sometimes we would, um, we would, uh, they, they, we'd, we'd, they'd come over for the weekend, they'd leave their instruments. I was like, well, uh-oh. Click, click. Yeah. I learned to play the trumpet. Trombone yeah. has seven positions. Yeah. Trumpet and all of the valve instruments on brass have seven fingering combinations. So right. I, I, I kind of I kind of figured that out. Right. And then, um, you know, going to college, um, I played a little bit of electric bass. And in the jazz band, our jazz yeah. band director wanted someone to play upright bass. Right. Everyone was into electric yeah. pork chops, easy to carry. Right, right, right. You know, and it was just more popular instrument. And, uh, they put the bass out, a couple of basses in the band room, so someone in the jazz band would play. Well, yeah. No one really wanted to play a tap on the upright bass. I was mm-hmm. like, hmm, I made an instrument laying around. I took it home, yeah. and I just started practicing. Okay. Just started practicing on it. Okay. And, uh, you know, to my apartment when I was in uh, Tallahassee. So okay. I would learn mainly by just, um, you know, if you learn the mechanics of an instrument, I feel like you can, you can, you can kind of teach yourself to wow. um, play it. Right. So I didn't have any formal bass lessons, but yeah. I've been around enough basses to yeah, know, to know what to do. Um, you know, about finger positions and, right. you know, and I did take piano lessons. So about the proper fingerings for scales and things like that, I did uh, learn and upon playing clarinet. So I studied some instruments, but most of them I just, if you leave your instrument at my house, it's going to get played. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. it. Right. right. Pretty much. Right. Man, mm-hmm. I think that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, I feel the same way. I can't play that many instruments, but mm-hmm. I told my wife that I want to have as many instruments as possible yeah. in the house, even just for mm-hmm. our children, yeah. because it's, that's how it starts. Mm-hmm. It's just, if it's available, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, how does this work? Well, you mm-hmm. see somebody or hear something, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, man, I got one of those at home. I need to figure out how to play it. So I think yeah. that's, that's, that's great. I, I think every household should have a piano. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's just, if, if, if it's um, you know an upright a box, it doesn't even right. have to be a great one. You know, yeah. like like you said, you start tinkering around with messing with it. I can make music with this. Yes. I mean, it's like yeah. You know, it's it, it's one of I think it's one of the world's greatest toys. I mean, right. I, I I call it a toy. But, yeah. You know, yeah. That's that that's kind of what it was. We used to go up there, ding 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 ding. But then right. it's like oh, I can make music. I can make a living doing this. Right. 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 <laughs> so you know. Right, right. It is. It's amazing things. It's a blessing. To me, I think about the fact of, you know, for the piano, it's just strings and, mm-hmm. you know, hammers, mm-hmm. dampers, and you mm-hmm. can construct something together mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. actually make melody and harmony and something mm-hmm. that somebody would really want to listen to. When I just think about it, you know, kind of like that, it's like really amazing yes. that, you know, you can even do that. So, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with <laughs> yes, you. Sir. Well, I was reading, too, that... um you know, I was interested in how you ended up started playing jazz. So mm-hmm. what I read, I just wanted to make sure that was correct, is that was it your aunt left a, um, a substantial record, jazz record collection that kind of got you got you into um, wanting to play jazz? Yeah, well, it was, it was a, it was a uh, great aunt. And when she passed, okay. she bequeathed to the family. It was her record collection wound up in our house in, okay. our, in our garage with a record player. And of that record collection was... This anthology of jazz, it was a five LP set of, of uh, jazz music. Okay. So, something like the history of jazz, and it was everything from the early slave chants mm-hmm. to the modern jazz of that time, at least wow. in that compilation, okay. which was um, like Sonny Rollins Quartet yeah. playing Sonny Moon for two. Yeah. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie Big Band, Count Basie's Big Band was yeah. on there playing uh, One O'Clock Jump. Oh, one, no, One Bass Hit. Yeah. Dizzy's playing One Bass Hit something like that but yeah. I listened to all 10 sides Dixieland Ragtime and New Orleans Jazz <clears throat> and I kind of fell I, I love the music that I heard yeah. but I just kind of fell in love with the, the music of New Orleans I'd just been playing trombone for about two, uh, maybe a little less than two years mm-hmm. and I could hear on that recording the music 
that was um, that sounded like an instrument that I played. The okay. instruments that I heard in band. Yeah. Now the music that the teenagers were into in that time was like Cool and the Gang, Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. Kiss was the popular rock group. Yeah. Groups like Chicago. So I liked that music too. Mm -hmm. So the jazz I was listening to wasn't popular. The jazz that was popular was Chuck Mangione and the you know Herb Albert yeah. or Tom yeah. Brown. Right. Jamaican. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. If you can play field so it's like, ah, oh, 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 right. I heard that song on the radio. Right, right. But my buddies used to, even in the band, they used to pick at me and, uh, you know, rib me by saying, oh, yeah, we like jazz. But Cliff, he liked that deep jazz. <laughs> That's what we called it because it was on yeah. a record and not necessarily being played on the uh, radio station, right. the popular radio station. Right, so, right. anyway, that was it. It was it was that record collection. Um, that was my first introduction uh, okay. to jazz because one mm -hmm. of my household, my father played classical piano. Yes. So he had a reel to reel recorder on the top of his upright grand piano with speakers in the room. You hear them Chopin, we love Beethoven, yeah, you know, yeah. Mozart, yeah. Um, Schumann, and Schubert, that kind of thing. And we would hear that growing up. On yeah. the radio, we heard country music. But yeah. practical, the practical application of his music would be to play in church. Mm -hmm. So he was, we lived in a small town and he played in. You know, several churches. Yeah. Um, there, so the music I heard a lot was gospel music. So yeah. that's the music that's most, I think, ingrained or embedded okay. in me. Okay. I learned jazz yeah. a little later, but the music that that most um, that can I don't know put me most in touch with myself yeah. is gospel music. Right. And right. I mean, and you can you know when you listen to some of the. You know, folks, like one of my favorite gospel records is, even though you didn't really ask me this. No, it's uh, okay. <laughs> I had a question, it, was, it kind of leads into something else I was going to ask you. So go ahead, go okay. ahead. Okay. Well, you know, Aretha Franklin, uh, Amazing oh, Grace. Yeah. You know, you had staples in gospel never... music. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just like you had staples in jazz. And, uh -huh. You know, then Aretha was known as the Queen of Soul. Yeah. But a lot of all of the music that developed in the United States, in some way, shape, or form, came out of the church, or the church was a place where you could express. Um, you know the feelings of you know, of your um, your what it comes out of the same experience, the right. African American experience in the right. United States, right. and whether it was jazz, or whether it went off into R and B, yeah. you know, soul, yeah. all of that. A yeah. lot of those musicians they they developed coming um, out of the church, and that's where yeah. I, I first heard. Um, I first heard live music was, okay. in, was in the church. So yeah. everything that I played, some kind of, we call yeah. it the blues. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. those, you know, for a long time has been kept separate. Separate. Yeah. Um, right, right. You know, the sacred and the second. Right. It comes right. out of the same experience. You can yeah. call, call it one thing or the other, but right. when you listen to the song, right. and, you know, you take the words and you have, um, you know, you, you, you have that. But back to your question, that was how, it, that, that was how jazz had come to me. Okay, That's, okay. We, did, we weren't jazz people. Yeah. Yeah. Where they weren't. We didn't live in the jazz mecca. Yeah. In Waynesboro, Georgia, and then right, right. growing up in Augusta, there were musicians that played jazz. But you know, yeah. in school, we weren't going to. And my mom didn't play that. We weren't. We, we weren't going to be going to a club anyway. Right, <laughs> so right, right. Like jazz club or any kind of club. Right. Before right. you had a job. Right. And anyway. Right. <laughs> no, I hear y'all. You were very similar, similar mm -hmm. to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that, I'm glad that you brought that up because I had a question um, in my notes about. The fact I was thinking that um, for me, when I uh, first discovered the Duke Ellington Sacred Concerts, mm -hmm. it was amazing to me because I was already writing things kind of in that fashion because for mm -hmm. me, that was important to me. I have also gospel backgrounds and just for me, the purpose behind what I was doing and what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, when I found out about Duke stuff, it was like, oh man, there's somebody else that kind of had the similar thing that I didn't even know about was already doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it made me think about even some of the stuff that you um, have done and, you know, talking about your gospel influence. What I just wanted to ask you, because I know you have the gospel truth. I knew about that. I'd written down um, the word mm -hmm. uh, in the cross, mm -hmm. um, uh, all CDs that you also had. Um, arrangements of hymns yes. um, in the jazz, you know, traditional jazz um, setting. But I just want you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, your choice for doing that and what that means to you, why, as an artist, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you choose to speak in that fashion. Well, you know, playing on the road, you, um, you know, when you talk about Duke Ellington, I mean, I read, read his book, and, you know, he was known as a jazz band leader, a great orchestrator, a great, mm -hmm. I mean composer. Yeah. 
But Duke himself said the music that's closest to him was the sacred concerts. That mm -hmm. is right. what defines yeah. him. And even though the world may not have known that at large, he, he said it himself. Right. Right. So, and being out on the road, even with the, uh, you know, what, what Marshall was said, you'd be playing jazz, it, great. But when, on those, some of those long uh, bus rides, those trips, the, the, the thing that always kept me centered was I'd be listening to like the Florida Mass Choir. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a, a, a really, really nice bus when we were on the road. And sometimes, you know, wives and significant others and children would come out if we were in a region yeah. where they could come and travel and that you could just get a plane ticket one place and out of another. It wasn't too expensive. Yeah. And, um, you know, they used to talk about me because in the front of the bus, would be the b uh, bebop, jazz, and yeah, you know, yeah. and I'd, I'd, be, I'd be up there too. You right, know what I mean, right. and sometimes in the back, but then right. every now and then we had one of those, you know, thirteen hour halls. Or sometimes I would just go back and put on, um, you know, Milton Brunson. Mm -hmm. You know, listen to, I, I, would, I would listen to gospel, yeah. and that's something that's always been um, a part of my upbringing, and it wasn't imposed on me. It yeah. wasn't forced on me. It was right. just something that I that I that I grew up immersed in, and it was just kind of uh, a, a way of life, yeah. and it wasn't explained or wasn't taught. It was just that that's what I grew up with. So on most of my CDs, I would probably play a hymn or yeah. a spiritual, whether yeah. it's a whether it's a gospel based CD or not. Like the Word is a compilation of different recordings that mm -hmm. I did, okay. and the cross is closer yeah. to what I wanted to do because I had a choir. Yeah. You know, the Gospel Truth was the first one I did on Criss Cross Records, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the guy uh, from 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 uh, from from Holland, from Amsterdam. From uh, he's not from Amsterdam. He's from uh, yeah, from Holland. Okay. Uh, that owns a record company, Jerry yeah. Tickets, uh, Chris Cross Records. He said, "I he would like to do gospel music, and maybe we can do something that's kind of gospel and jazz mm -hmm. based." I was like, "Okay, yeah. now you're talking. Now you now you're talking my language." So, right, right. And on that record, we had a um, great singer who's uh, still with us, Carrie Smith, and we just did. It was more a it was more so jazz renditions of of. Um, gospel music, yeah. hymns and spirituals yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. But what I always wanted to do is to have like a, a choir yeah. and, you know, and that kind of thing. And I got closer to that with um, and, and the cross. And mm -hmm. you know, when I listen when I listen to my CDs, I, I don't really like to hear myself play because I'm always um, you know, nitpicking about what yeah. could have been better. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I should have done this and I should have done that. But yeah. you know, sometimes I can listen to that and listen to the other the voices, the voices singing. It's like that is the point where I feel like I'm in, I'm in touch with the greatest power yeah. ever. Yeah. And, you know, nothing can really re re replace that feeling. So when I'm doing music that is, that's mindful of that or that reminds me of of, of anything relative to that spiritual experience, mm -hmm. it's, um you know, uh, that's just, that's, that, that's me. Yeah. I, folks know me as a jazz musician. Yeah. I just like to look at myself as a musician, but yeah. you know, I love, I love great, Classical music, right, right. You know, like great blues. I, I like to uh, like to dance. I used to book. I used to get down. Yeah, I used to go yeah. to the club and, and, and do all of that. Music yeah. that feels good. But the thing that always keeps me grounded or centered, I feel like I find myself mm -hmm. inside inside of um, inside of gospel music. Okay, okay, so, that's great. So, so that's why you will see on, on jazz records. Even when I did Danny Boy, mm -hmm. um, Danny Boy was one of the first when I could play an octave. Yeah. After playing with one of the first songs, it was called Finlandia, a tune from County Derry. Mm -hmm. London Derry. London Air. Derry Air, yes. Yeah, I, I did that and I was like, but pretty song. Yeah. When I heard somebody sing, he looked behind my phone. At I church. was going to say, that's what I knew the song I as. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, said, Wait a minute, I know that song. The right. song was singing it. Then I know right. the words to it. Right. Like, so it took on a, a whole other meaning yeah. to me. I was like, so when I recorded it, yeah. you know, people, you, you can tell the church people yeah. and the, you know, I want to say regular, but, you know, music people that yeah. didn't necessarily grow up with that. Say, can you play, um, I love your rendition of Danny Boy. I said, mm -hmm. thanks. I said, well, that, that, I said, that's the melody. But I said, when I'm playing it, I'm thinking about he looked beyond my fault. Right, then, right. But then you have the church people. Yeah. If I had it on the CD, is that, I think one CD I put it on there is. Uh, he looked beyond my fault in parentheses, uh -huh. Danny Boy. And uh -huh. then another one I put, you know, Danny Boy, and in parentheses, he looked beyond my fault. So, yeah. you know, the music is always, it's it, it's all connected. And when you when you when you make that ultimate connection, you know, there's nothing like that. It can't be, it can't it can't be denied, regardless of the categorization yeah. or the terms that we, that we put on it. Right. Know? I right. think it's a direct gift uh, from God. So, when I put Amazing Grace or um, 
precious Lord. Mm -hmm. you know, whenever you do something like that, and then you know, to the song is powerful as it is, but then when you learn why Tom McDorsey wrote that song, it gives you a whole lot. You know, when you learn how Amazing Grace came about, right? It's, it's like, right. oh wow, man. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, it's a, a beautiful song, and it's uh, great to have experienced it growing up. But then when you get into those those deeper meanings yeah. behind, it's like, oh wow, this is. You know, you sing it with yeah. a different. You, you, you sing it in a different uh, voice or with different kind of conviction, and you play it that way too. So, right. and right. when I'm doing that, yeah, nothing, not, nothing really touches that. Yeah, all the yeah. bebop in the world. I mean, I like playing it. I learned to do it. It's like developing a craft. Yeah, you talk about Duke Ellington. Yeah, same thing with uh, you know Muhammad Ali. He developed a really great craft for what he stood for as a as a man, especially in the latter part of uh, the, the latter part of his years when he right. really became enlightened. Was he he he, uh, he understood something that eventually I think we all see. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm yeah. gonna stop. No, nah, that's cool. I'm with, I'm with I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Well, that kind of goes. You kind of already speaking to that. <clears throat> but I want to say that the show is called the way I hear it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I believe that you know all music speaks. It's just about what you're saying, what mm -hmm. you're trying to say. And I think it really comes from what it starts from what's inside the musician and what's inside the artist and you know the people um, receive that and relate to that and uh, for me I've decided that you know for me I feel like my purpose is to create music that speaks life and that meets people wherever they are if they need to put on the CD um, for comfort for healing for joy or you know whatever to dance to, to laugh or you know and whatever the connection but that, that it be something that would uplift them and really help them Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to um, you to you kind of already talking about that, but if you had any more thoughts on just you know um, as an artist, what you want people to come away with um, when they hear your music and what it means to you, like you know the way you hear. It. How do you you know what are your thoughts? Well, I, music has been. I don't ever feel like my life has been danger, but uh, music is it's like a it's a it's a lifesaver. It's a way to it shatters the walls that we create yeah. between us, whether it's men and women, whether it's black and white, whether it's classical and jazz. And I've just seen seen that. It's like a great clip of, of uh, Louis Armstrong on the State Department to his two African nations at war. And they call the troops to attend a concert. It's mm -hmm. 100,000 people, 50,000 people on each side, weeks ago at war, separated only about five feet away, watching mm -hmm. And then listening to a Louis Armstrong concert, yeah. now, and, you know, something like that doesn't say something about the power of music, right? You know, and and I, I feel I feel that um, in, inside of me when I'm moved by music, when when I when I feel it. Yeah. So um, and that's mostly kind. Of, it's uh, kind of taking place in church, and yeah. you probably know the feeling I'm talking about when. Mm -hmm. Something just gets inside of you, yeah. and some people it's when the spirit moves you. Yes. Yeah. You know, you, you can uh, find eloquent words to describe it, but nothing is, you know, just just whenever you have that 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 feeling, it's it's great, it's marvelous, it's wonderful, it's all of those great things. And when I play music, I want to give that feeling. I mean, yeah. when, you, when you felt that, yeah. um, you know, you want everybody to feel that. Right. You, you you want people to feel that joy, and you want them to feel uplifted. So right. when I listen to the music of Louis Armstrong, right. or mm -hmm. just the great execution of anyone playing music or when someone that does something for you they could be Michael Jordan playing basketball when you see them do, do that it's not about the tricks it's like what he had to do to get uh, yeah. to that and how re how much he had to reach inside of him himself or um, yeah it, himself to develop the skill to be able to do that and right. it's it's um, it's inspirational I mean you know it's, it's uplifting and mm -hmm. that's why yeah, people cheer I mean that's dealing with sports, mm -hmm. but um, you know, for for me, music, I like I like to feel good. Yeah. I've had times at times and things as everyone else has in their life, but things didn't feel good. It didn't seem right. But when when, when it's great, it's great. And when you kind of get when the, or you begin to understand that you're responsible for that and that yeah. you can do it, yeah. it's like and you can share that with people. Right. I mean that, that's that's what I want. I, that's what I want to do. Right. So whether I'm playing. Um, Blues, bebop, you know, anytime if I get caught, if I'm in playing 
gospel music, with yeah. other gospel yeah. musicians. Yeah. And I'll say this as a side note, all jazz musicians, mm -hmm. if you didn't, didn't really grow up in church, they don't, you can probably learn it, but if you don't have that, um, if, if, if you don't have that experience, you mm -hmm. have to get it, whether mm -hmm. you grow up in the church, you go to it, you yeah. study with the church musician or whatever, it's difficult to do because all jazz pianists yeah. Can't necessarily, don't, don't necessarily right. play play gospel. So yeah. you mess around and you get some musicians that have grown up in that. Like when I was playing in um, Wenton's band, there was about yeah. five or six of us. Yeah. Then, you know, some guys grew up in New Orleans. I grew up in Georgia. Eric Reed, uh, from North Carolina, grew up yeah. in L.A. Yeah. But everybody went to church. Yeah. So when, you know, you playing jazz all the time. Right. But when somebody starts singing a hymn and yeah. everybody just falls in, right. it's, and we just start, you know, play, yeah. it's like you know, it's 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 that feeling. Yeah, it, diff, just from just being from different places in the world, but being able to connect. Right. And I, I think when I'm playing music, I want to do that. It doesn't matter who's in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, Christians, atheists, jazz lovers, right. jazz haters, right. like right. you know. And I've again seen the power of how music can affect people. Yeah. When, when I first joined Wenton's band and I was walking down the streets in Germany and if, if looks could kill, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Um, or even France. And I thought it was because I was African American. That wasn't it at all. It was yeah. because I was American. And I guess Europe didn't have great relations with mm -hmm. America, mm -hmm. with the with, uh, United States of America back then. But when the music started, all of that stuff went out of the window. Right, right. You know, playing with um, orchestras where it's like, well, you know, jazz musicians, well, you know, they, you know, we call we still call or orchestral music legit. Yeah. And Clark Terry made a funny comment one time saying, "Well, I guess yeah, I'm gonna play my illegitimate jazz music." <laughs> but when you give when you're given the same platform, and uh, we once played with the New York Philharmonic, we playing the music of Grieg, the Pierre Gant Suite. Yeah. They played the traditional classical arrangements, mm -hmm. and then we did uh, Duke Ellington, Billy Strayhorns. Yeah. Yeah. renditions, and we was there on the same stage yeah. in the center of the orchestra. Yeah. It felt a little. You know, that uh, separation that we don't like to talk about at first, mm -hmm. but by the mm -hmm. end of the week, it was like the glass that stood between the classical musician yeah. and the jazz musician yeah, it shattered it because yeah. it was purely about music and right. purely about a connection right. that music has, maybe it's not the only way, but it's a it's a surefire way to connect right. people. Right. And when I'm playing, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to feel connected. If you're listening to me play, it's not about the applause for me. It's yeah. like... You know, did, did 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 you have a good time? Oh, can, right. can we all get on? Can we all get on the same page? Yeah. Oh, we're here together, and yeah. you know, regardless of what you're dealing with, good right. or bad, right. we we we're here together right now. Right. You know, right. let's let's enjoy this time. That we're gonna have together. Right. Right. No, I love that. I love that. For fear of getting too too serious, I want to say this, and then I'll move on. But what you're saying reminds me of, for me, the um, it reminds me of scripture in the Bible mm -hmm. that actually, I guess in Samuel, it, it talks about David. Mm -hmm. I've studied David, he's a musician, mm -hmm. and different things in his life, but what you're saying, um, to me, you even see that in the Bible where David went to, he was asked to go play for Saul, because Saul was, like you said, having trouble, but basically it said, you know, having uh, evil spirits torment him. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like what you're saying about people, um, uh, the music speaking and people being able to receive that, it's like they knew, because the first thing they said, um, told Saul was to, you know, go find some a musician to come play for you so you can feel better. Mm. They got David, mm. and it they listed like seven characteristics of David that mm. qualified him to go play. Mm -hmm. Only one of them talked about him being skillful as a musician. It was mm -hmm. other stuff about him being valiant and you mm -hmm. know who his father was. And then said the Lord is with me. Mm -hmm. And it said when he went, didn't he say he said any you know that he sang. Mm -hmm. They say just play it, mm -hmm. and immediately Saul felt better. And for mm -hmm. me, it's the same thing. It's like I've always, um, for me, that's really the focus as far as being able to speak and just you know mm -hmm. allow people to be able to receive that. So I think that's great, man. I, pre I appreciate that. Yes, so cool, cool. Okay, well, um, I could keep on asking questions, but I think we can we can we can um, stop. The only other thing I was going to mention was I saw you in New York. Um, I guess in August, my mm -hmm. last year, my wife and I were there. You mm -hmm. invited us to a concert that just blew my mind away. You were commissioned um, to write a piece for a silent film yeah. of um, Oscar Michaud. Is that mm -hmm. how you say yeah, it? Yeah, Oscar Michaud. He's the, and you can correct me. He's the first, was he considered the first um, African-American major uh, filmmaker. 
filmmaker, yes, yes, right? Yes. But man, that was, you know, you know, as a musician, we play a lot. Mm-hmm. Don't always get to flip around and get to go to a lot of shows with yeah. her, but I was, man, I was really blown away. But I wanted to bring that up and just let you talk a little bit about that because I was really, you know, you um, invited us and I didn't even know exactly what it was going to be, mm-hmm. but it, it blew me away. But I just well, wanted to um, let you talk a little bit about that. Well, that was, that, that, movie was called Within Our Gates, okay. and um, it was done in 1919, um, and it was the it was Oscar Micheaux's answer, if you will, to D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, and the nation that he was talking about was the Ku Klux Klan, Birth of the Klan, mm-hmm. and it was like, it, 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 felt, it seemed like he celebrated the, uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan, and um, so what Michelle wanted to do was to write, to, to give his account of you know, uh, you know that when, when you saw the film, you saw black folks that were educated, African yeah. Americans that you had, saw those that w- were suffering. You saw sharecroppers, but you saw all facets of um, African American people. Whereas yeah. in Birth of a Nation, it, yeah. we were all like, you know, buffoons pretty yeah. much. And um, so Michelle wanted he, he wanted to give a he was very controversial in that he. Like your show is called The Way I Hear It. Mm-hmm. His films were, if I had to put a title on it, The Way I See It. Yeah, yeah. And it was just truthful. It was just like the relationships between, you know, slaves and slave masters. Like mm-hmm. the uh, the um, girl in the end of the film, Sylvia, her father was white. And the guy that was trying to kill her was, you know, he had, uh, back during those times, he had a... A, um, a I'm, not, I'm not sure if she was his mistress or if, uh, if it was his wife. Mm-hmm. But... That, at that time, the United States, you know, that didn't exist. It, okay. We weren't that far along okay. yet. So, and Michelle put this in the film, and it was like, you know, it was just, it was pretty co- controversial. But that's the second film that I did. The first one was called Body and Soul. And mm-hmm. I did, um, we did record it and release it. Just send me an email, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Okay. So, but anyway, when they called yeah. me to do this film, I, yeah. I, I, I love dealing with the uh, film because of the, 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 the content. Okay. Um, first and uh, foremost, it dealt with life um, that I, I see as I saw it, even though I wasn't a chef, but my mm-hmm. folks were, yeah. I grew up in the country and a lot of those things, I could hear those sounds. Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, the, that was the second film, the first film being Body and Soul. There were three main places that scenes took place, church, the house, and bar scene. I didn't mm-hmm. really become familiar with that until later, but... The story was was that uh, Paul Robeson, that was his debut as an actor on film, yeah. uh, in 1925 would come out. And, and Michelle was ahead of his time. He had Robeson playing two different characters. Mm-hmm. And he may not have been the first person to do it, but the um, just the content itself, for me, having grown up in church, it, it spoke to me because... You know, there was a time where it wasn't looked upon really well that I played anything other than gospel music. Yeah, it was like, yeah. you can't be out there playing that jazz. Mm-hmm. You can't, like, be cool in the gang. You can't be, you know, and then, you know. Uh, so it's, it's something that's always been a part of me because yeah, it was yeah. somewhat of a dilemma that I had to deal with um, right. growing up and making a decision. I was like, man, if this is the devil's music, I'm like, man, the devil got some really good music. <laughs> just like, uh, I like this, but you know, it turns out that it wasn't. Yeah, a lot of yeah. the separation that we have um, between human beings, between one another, from state to state, from you know, from gender, from mm-hmm. you know, um, it, it are things that we just yeah. that we just set up for ourselves. We yeah. just have to sometimes look beyond it or right. seek that ultimate truth. So, doing right. both of those films were it was it was great for me because I got a chance to have uh, jazz musicians on stage, and, and I, I love choir but you know yeah. we I couldn't have an orchestra I couldn't have a choir I said okay well I'm gonna get my, get my orchestra I'm gonna orchestrate it where this, some things can sound like this and yeah. y'all gonna sing right I was gonna sing so, I was gonna sing it y'all was sing it so anyway um um I uh loved it it was a, it was a controversial film and I think it's something that should be brought to the attention and that, as I understand that night there were a couple of people that got up during the scenes where it was implied that the, those uh, two folks got hanged now it was a story. It, there was the dark side, mm. but Oscar Michelle put it out there because right. you, don't, you don't want to necessarily hide from it. It happened, right. you right. know. And it was like, right. oh man, it's, you know. And it, it was difficult because I had to watch the film two or three times yeah. to just get all of the inside story, yeah. like the 
white guy in the end they went to go after they killed the parents yeah. was going to kill it was going to kill the lady and she hadn't done anything but when he saw the scar um just above her clavicle he had to stop he said that's my child yeah it's like it's deep yeah. but it happened so fast you don't even really you don't even right. really you don't really get it probably at the first right. um watching of it because of all the other things like right. it's mm-hmm. coming right after a scene where they just hang and burn two black people it's like mm-hmm. so that's still kind of processing and that's like wait a minute you know yeah they were they, 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 they were killed unjust and then you had all kind. You had all kind of African American folks. You know, the educated ones, yeah. uh, and and the guy that worked for the guy that got uh, killed, yeah. who told the story wrong because he didn't really see what happened. Yeah. Who actually killed the man was um, the white folks. They called him a modern day uh, Nero, and he I guess he was just messing over everybody in the land. But it, it was so multi layered, and I just wanted to kind of capture the essence of that with. Um, with the music, and a- a- mm-hmm. after having heard it, um, I would make some changes um, now because I was writing like right up until the uh, performance, and I said, "Yeah, I-, I like this and I like that." Now that I've seen it afterwards, there's some things that I would, some some of the musical choices that I would change. But you know, it's, it's stuff that um, I love doing, and an opportunity to tell a story. Yeah. And the last commission that oh. I just did was for the city of Columbus, which mm-hmm. dealt again with that dilemma. Okay. Saturday night versus Sunday morning. Yeah. You know, when there was a scene, I said, okay, we're going to do Saturday night. We did Marvin Gaye and we did, we did um, Earth, Wind, and Fire yeah. for the city of Columbus. And then we said, well, here, here, you know, here, here's the dilemma. And then we did I'll Take You There yeah. by the Staples Singers because that was actually originally done as a gospel song. It was yeah. one of the first crossover songs ever. Yeah. And then, you know, and then we did a prayer now and they, uh, a gospel tune, but anyway, I, I said all that just to say this: it, the, the movie, the content of both of those films, they they touched me in a way that I could relate to because yeah. of something having grown up down south mm-hmm. and not seeing all of those things, but listening to my parents right. um, talk about what they had to deal with yeah. and you know how they wanted to be really careful yeah. um, with us and you know make sure that we were protected because even though those things weren't happening. They, they still, still, still was you know like racism still exists. Um, it's just under a different cover. But from what they saw, the images mm-hmm. that that, that um, you know that they had, and like you know, it, it was. Um, well, I just say this: doing those films was uh, was a great opportunity for me to address some of those uh, issues that I had to deal with personally, and those issues that um, the content of the film that actually existed. You yeah. know, even if you don't want to see it. Yeah, it's ugly, but yeah. it's the truth. Well, it, it happened, right. and I'm going to say, yes, right. I want to do music for this. Right. So, you know, right. it's, it, I, I feel connected to it in some kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay. It was great. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful show. So I was blown, blown away. Thank you. Well, I thought that um, you do a lot of work with kids and mm-hmm. a lot of clinics and master classes. I know you travel all over the world, and that's an important part of your um, you know, professionalism and what you do um, and giving back. So I thought it'd be fitting if I had my kids just ask you um, a question or yes. two just to see sometimes they come up with things that I couldn't even um, think about. I did. I admit that I did kind of give them some direction this time, but my son sometimes still might come up with something. Well, that's so. right. He's young. Young can come up. Yeah. How old were you when you started playing? How old was I when I started playing? Well, I, well, I heard music since before I could remember. But I started playing trombone. I was 12 years old because I was in the uh, seventh grade, so I remember that. Um, And my father tried to get me to play piano at age, I think it was five or six. So, and I learned to play two tunes, as I said earlier, the boogie woogie and chopsticks. So that was at piano, age five, and I started playing trombone at age 12. Mm-hmm. Cool. Did you have a question? Sure. How old were you when you started writing music? How old was I when I started writing music? Well, it's, um, hmm. as soon as I started playing piano, I started taking piano lessons again, I think, when I was 11 years old. And I um, met a really good piano teacher that he taught us. He played in church, and he, um, you know, he taught from a method book. I think it was a David Carr Glover um, method piano book. But he would always give us things to work on. 
uh, to, to um, play by ear. So once I learned to play and learn songs on the radio, then you know, I'd sit down to the piano with no music in front of me, with no, no radio on, and I would just start to um, play, and i just start playing through a chord progression or something. I was always terrible with words, but probably by the time I was uh, 12 or 13, I started to make up songs. You know, I didn't have the terminology then, like compose. I wasn't thinking about the word compose, composition, um, you know, uh, recapitulation or uh, improvisation. I'm going to make it up. So I would sit down to the piano and I would start making up songs then. So probably when I was 13, that's when I started. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank well, you. Well, nice to meet you guys. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you being here, taking time to play. I really enjoy playing from your CD, Hello Pops. We played yes. the title. That was the title, title track. Yes. yes. Yeah, Hello Pops. So I really enjoy getting a chance to play that, play that with you. And uh, man, just sitting to talk with you, I want you to know that, you know, for me, hearing you play, listen to your CDs, and even having a chance to play with you, that you speak to me. And I really appreciate what you do and, you know, want you to know that, you know, I hear you, you know, yeah, and yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah. I receive it and I think it's wonderful. So thank you so much. I well, really I appreciate think, bro, it. I, pre I want to say the same thing. I, I, I appreciate the same thing from you. I think we first met years ago on a gig with James Gilliard. Yes, I'm not sure yeah. the piano player, but yeah. I think it was, I got your CD that night. And that's still, still one of my... Um, one of my favorite CDs I listen to when your, your daughter was singing. I yeah. think your wife sings a song. Yes, on your yes, CD. she does. She does. Uh, it was just beautiful music. You know, it wasn't just wasn't just gospel. It wasn't just mm -hmm. jazz. It yeah. was just just music. And, and I couldn't put a uh, a category. I couldn't put it into a category. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, say the CD. What, what what kind of category can I put it in? Just good music. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's 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 um it's it's, be it's beautiful music. And you know. It, it reached me. So, you know, I mean, like, when you called me to do this, normally yeah. I'd be like, I have need to be in my room writing music. Right, right. So, I mean, you know, my manager said, do you really want to do it? I said, no, no. I, said, no, I know who this is. I know who it is. So, yeah, I, I, pre I appreciate it. And, you know, anytime, call on me anytime. Bro. I appreciate your music, too. And, you know, it, it's clear to me. When I heard that CD, I said, okay, I see where he's coming from. Yeah. He's a, he's a musician, but he's also he's also touched. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Well, thank you so much. Watch Live Gordon. Watch Live Gordon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me.